This video is going to be a quick overview of the diversity of birds uh, with a focus first on classification, but then an introduction into the diversity of birds in the Northeastern United States. Um, so birds haven't always existed. Uh, it was about in the middle of the Mesozoic era that meat-eating dinosaurs, which had gradually um, developed avian traits, whether it be lengthened hands or downy feathers, later flight feathers, um, then became capable of uh, you know, possibly gliding and then at some point uh, flight. And then for the remainder of the Mesozoic era, there was a number of bird lineages which uh, evolved, but the same extinction which wiped out the dinosaurs then wiped out the most common group of um, birds at uh, the time. So many birds became extinct um, 65 million years uh, ago. Of the bird lineages uh, that uh, exist uh, today, the most primitive uh, branch uh, includes the giant uh, flightless birds like rheas in South America, ostriches in um, Africa, uh, kiwis, emus, cassowaries in uh, uh, Australia and, and New Zealand, and then even a few flying birds like the tinamous of South America. Um, they have uh, primitive skull structures, what's called the old mouth, and so the name of this group is what's called the paleonathus birds, uh, which literally means the old mouth uh, birds. So in the family tree of birds, which has survived that mass uh, extinction, um, this is the most primitive uh, branch, and today they're uh, largely uh, confined uh, to uh, the southern regions and include uh, many uh, flightless uh, forms. Um, then uh, the remaining birds, they had modified skull uh, features, which results in them being called the, quote, new mouth birds or neonathus birds. Um, they uh, certainly underwent most of their diversification uh, after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Maybe the first couple branches actually had uh, divided prior to that. So here's a question we don't know the answer to. Um, so where in this family tree did the mass extinction at the end of the Mesozoic era occur? Did it occur here? So maybe one group of birds survived and then diversified into all the birds we had today? Or did the mass extinction say occur here? In which case there was maybe one, two, three lineages of birds which survived the extinction to give rise to the, uh, the birds we have today. Um, that's you know currently um, uh, under debate. Um, but what we can see is that uh, birds form a family tree, which we could then uh, divide, here's once again some of the flightless birds, uh, into uh, related groups. So birds are related to each other, they sure, certainly share features, but they're not equally related to uh, each other. And just like we can have smaller groups like the genus or the family, uh, then you can have larger groups uh, uh, such as uh, the order uh, the superorder, uh, uh, the subfamily, the infraorder, et cetera. So there can be this great nested uh, hierarchy of uh, bird uh, relationships. Um, one of the uh, early divisions, which seems to be um, more separated from the other ones, is what's called the gallo and seri, which would include the galliforms. These are the chickens and uh, their relatives. Uh, and then would also then include um, the anseriforms, which include uh, ducks, uh, geese, and the like. And when I say uh, chickens and their relatives, uh, certainly uh, throughout the world, whether you know, it be uh, turkeys um, or uh, uh, a number of these other uh, uh, lineages, uh, there are certainly uh, relatives throughout uh, the world. So uh, the gallo anseri, did they uh, branch uh, before the end of the mass extinction? Um, that's certainly uh, possible, so a couple of their lineages might have uh, survived. And then here we have the lineage uh, of uh, ducks uh, and geese. Um, and so I you know, just mentioned a few fossil forms. Uh, as we get into the um, uh, the duck-like forms, the anseriforms, uh, one of uh, the uh, members of this uh, the southern screamer still has the primitive feature of having claws on their wings, uh, and so uh, that's a primitive feature. Some of the early ducks uh, look very different from ducks today. They were very long-legged, and so it seems that uh, you know certainly this group. 
uh, evolved over time. There were no chickens or ducks in the age of dinosaurs, nor in the early age of uh, mammals. Instead, you know, these lineages uh, developed uh, slowly. Uh, now, uh, to, today, if we were to consider you know, uh, these uh, groups, we could subdivide them into family, genera, um, and there are some which are in danger of uh, extinction because uh, of you know, loss of habitat. Uh, here are some guans from uh, South America. They are in the uh, chicken group. Um, and so as we split them into you know, their uh, diversity, uh, many are localized in certain parts of uh, the world. Uh, some include species which are in danger of, uh, of extinction, et cetera. So the galliforms, that's an order of birds, which includes the chickens, uh, the guans, uh, the turkeys, the um, uh, curassows, uh, the pheasant, as you just saw. And anseriforms, that's an order which includes uh, the ducks, uh, the geese, and uh, their relatives. Uh, here, once again, is that southern screamer, a primitive member of this uh, group. They actually have claws on their wings, as you can see uh, here. A number of birds have small claws on their wings, which are retained from um, uh, the, their ancestors, which had clawed uh, uh, fingers. Um, we could split this order of uh, birds into separate uh, families. And once again, we could go throughout the world as some are more generally uh, uh, found throughout the family, like the duck family, uh, Anatidae. Um, and then some are located to more specific parts of uh, the world, and uh, some are in danger of uh, extinction. I just want to say a few mentions about orders of, of birds and then, you know, perhaps get back uh, to, you know, ducks and focus on, say, you know, wildlife, um, uh, which was uh, local to the Northeast United States. Um, certainly the birds of the past were different from the ones of today. Not only did the ducks not always uh, exist, like I said, they were transitional forms, which were still long-legged, uh, that had a duck-like bill, but were unlike ducks in other uh, and other senses. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the same can be said of penguins. The early penguins uh, were uh, kind of like cormorants in their body shape and not like uh, modern uh, pen uh, penguins. And when birds, be uh, when dinosaurs became extinct for a brief period of time, there weren't really large predatory uh, uh, terrestrial animals. And so some birds evolved a giant shape and became six feet tall, 12 feet tall, um, uh, you know, enormous skulls, maybe the size of horse skulls. And for a while, birds were the major predators on Earth. And uh, before then, the predatory mammals like cats, dogs, bears, and the like uh, evolved. And so bird diversity certainly includes a number of uh, extinct uh, forms. Now, I just want to introduce the idea of the classification of birds because there's an enormous number of birds. The number of bird species is about the same as the number of mammals, reptiles, and amphibians combined. So in terms of terrestrial vertebrates, in terms of number of species, um, birds are the most successful, equal to all of the others uh, combined. And as we see in other groups, um, there are big groups. And so, you know, we have birds, which we consider a class. We could split that into the paleonathus birds, the neonathus birds, and then we can split those into orders um, where birds uh, share uh, specific uh, uh, features, and then we can break that then into families. So, for example, there is an order which includes woodpeckers, picaforms, um, but it also includes then families other than the woodpecker family, picidae. Uh, and so, for example, toucans are in pika forms, the order, but they are not in the, uh, the family which includes um, uh, woodpeckers. If we were to look then specifically at um, uh, woodpeckers uh, in the family um, at peak a day, um, we could find a number of uh, subfamilies. Uh, and so uh, the subfamilies include uh, rhinex, uh, piculets, which are, you know, uh, very small, and then the true woodpeckers. So once again, now we have a family of woodpeckers, the picidae, but in this family there are subfamilies, and so rhinex have some woodpecker features, but not enough to be considered, say, a true woodpecker. Um, these are piculets, 
uh, from South America. They have some woodpecker features, but not enough to be considered true woodpeckers. And so once again, when we look at any group of organisms, birds included, we see what's called a nested hierarchy of groups within groups. Then when we're, we're in the, the subfamily of true woodpeckers, we could subdivide them into genera uh, and then uh, different species. Here are some of the woodpeckers of South America. And as always, as we start looking at this classification, many are specific to certain parts of the world, and thus they are vulnerable to environmental pressures, and some have thought to become extinct, such as the imperial woodpecker, which was uh, uh, the largest woodpecker in uh, recent history, and then the ivory-billed uh, woodpecker, uh, which is thought to be extinct, although there are some possible sightings uh, uh, more uh, recently. And uh, so certainly uh, we could then go throughout all of uh, the groups of uh, birds and do this. So there are different bird orders. So the birds of prey are put into a group the, of the Ecipitriformes. Uh, these would include uh, hawks uh, and eagles. Uh, and falcons, we could argue over some of these. So for example, owls are birds of prey, but they're not in this group. And the two groups of vultures are not closely related. So old world vultures uh, are certainly related to hawks uh, and eagles. Um, this uh, group of new world vultures, which would include condors, there has been some uh, discussion over some classification schemes, put them in this order. Others have allied them more with uh, other groups such as uh, storks. So here you see uh, condors. Once again, fossil birds could be much more diverse. Some members of this group were even larger than the condor, uh, which is the largest flying bird. Um, so uh, there were some which had, in say North America, which had wingspans of say 18 feet, the pteratorns, some from South America were even larger, maybe a wingspan of 26 feet uh, or so. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we could uh, do, once again, is go through the birds and split them into uh, orders and then split each order into uh, families. Uh, and I have some videos here. Um, but once again, uh, some of this would then uh, introduce bird orders which are not which are specific in different parts of the world. So for example, the Sitica forms include parrots, parakeets, etc., which are largely in um, Latin uh, America, Southern Africa, um, and uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and Australia. And so if you live, say, in the United States, uh, th there wouldn't be any uh, native parrots there. There once were. The Carolina parakeet uh, was found throughout uh, uh, eastern the United States, um, but it became uh, extinct um, several hundred years ago uh, because of, uh, of human uh, influence. Um, and so therefore, because a lot of birds are specific to different parts of uh, the world, uh, now having just introduced the idea that, you know, the same classification that we see in, uh, in other groups where we, you know, we have, you know, big groups, there's the class of birds, and then we can bring these into a nested hierarchy of groups uh, of uh, varying degrees of uh, relationships. I'd now like to talk about the diversity of birds in the Northeast United States. And then um, I have recordings of uh, the diversity of birds which can be found in uh, the Northeastern United States. And so obviously not to repeat those because uh, each of these playlists then goes into the bird species in far greater uh, detail. I'd just like to point out, so um, for example, let's say start off with aquatic birds. Uh, loons uh, are not uh, native all year round for the most part uh, to you know, the area of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, where I currently live and my students live. Um, but loons certainly pass through on uh, during their uh, migration. And a number of the very primitive birds are loon-like. And so going back even to right before the age of dinosaurs ended, uh, there are questions, you know, does, you know, this, there, there were thoughts that the, the lineage of loon-like birds um, is actually uh, quite uh, old. Uh, cormorants are also uh, aquatic um, birds, and some of the early penguins uh, certainly resemble cormorants in uh, their, uh, their body uh, shape, and so they are native um, uh, to this area. And if one were then to consider uh, the various 
aquatic birds in our area. You know, there are certainly uh, grebes, uh, there are uh, herons, uh, so herons can be uh, both uh, large and small. So we have you know, great blue herons, uh, the great egret, uh, which is white, uh, but then bitterns uh, uh, can also um, include uh, large uh, birds. Um, but then there are also then smaller um, uh, herons, smaller egrets, smaller bitterns. Uh, and so uh, herons uh, are adapted that they can, you know, stay very still uh, with, you know, their long thin legs appearing, you know, just to be aquatic vegetation. And then they can very uh, suddenly uh, grab aquatic organisms, whether they be fish, frogs, uh, you know, baby turtles, snakes, uh, etc., cetera, uh, with their um, uh, with their bills. Um, so some of these are common in our area. Um, and then some like the little blue heron, it is possible uh, to see, um, but more common uh, elsewhere in the United States, such as in uh, the Southern uh, United States. Uh, there, uh, in addition to herons, there are other uh, birds such as rails, right? So here you see a rail, uh, which are you know, very good at hiding in uh, you know, the vegetation near uh, aquatic life. Uh, there uh, are snipes, uh, the American woodcock, kill deer. Um, and so there are a diversity of birds which one can find uh, primarily in uh, aquatic uh, habitats. Uh, there are a large number of uh, ducks and uh, geese There are a large number of ducks and geese, which one can be found in our uh, area. And as I go along, just uh, what I'm interesting about diversity is that uh, if you truly want to, you know, see the species which live in one's area, you might have to say go bird watching uh, in different times of year. So, for example, you might think, oh, you know, I'll wait till you know summer. You know, it's nice and warm. I'll, I'll do bird watching then. But a large number of ducks and geese, for example, in the area where I live do not spend their entire year in this area. They obviously migrate um, uh, south uh, during winter and come back during warm weather months. But a number of species spend their summers north of where I currently live in the northern United States and in Canada. So for example, these pintails, you can see them where I live, but only during migration. They are passing through the region of the country you know, where I live as they go north to their, um, uh, to their uh, uh, summer grounds. And then in the fall, they migrate south uh, again through here. Uh, and so uh, if you're considering uh, diversity, uh, there is diversity which exists in your part of the world, perhaps only during parts of the year during migration. But that doesn't make it any less important. Uh, and so consider the challenge that say these ducks face. They not only need habitat, they need habitat in, say, three parts of the world. So let's say that some of these live in Canada during the summer. That's where they nest, they raise their young, and they spend all summer. So they need habitat, food sources um, in uh, Canada. Um, but then let's say during um, uh, winter, they migrate south, let's say, to the southern United States. Well, then they need habitat there. But then to get back and forth, they're going to need habitat all along, say, the eastern United States, um, where they can uh, rest, uh, feed uh, for the next leg of their journey in migration. And if any of these regions of habitat were to be developed or lost, then that would threaten the entire species because they need not only winter grounds in the south and summer grounds in the north, they need a habitat along uh, the way as uh, they migrate. Um, and so uh, that's a challenge which faces uh, many uh, uh, birds. So for example, there are geese which one can find uh, in the Northeast United States all throughout uh, the year. The, um, I would say like uh, Canada geese. Uh, there are um, then migratory geese, uh, geese which can uh, stop through like these snow geese. So snow geese would certainly not be seen in uh, the Northeast United States in uh, the, the summer, um, uh, but they can be found here in uh, the winter um, and can be seen uh, migrating uh, through. Uh, 
I, here it, I have a video of uh, a snow goose that was found here in warmer months, but apparently it was because it had injured at its uh, wing. Um, uh, and so uh, there are uh, uh, birds which migrate, and then birds prefer different habitats. So for example, um, there are some uh, birds which would be found more commonly uh, along uh, the coasts. So here's a type of goose called a brant, not that common this far inland. Um, but if you were to then go to um, areas uh, closer to uh, the coast, uh, then you would find uh, more brants. Um, there are some uh, swans which are native to our area and others like the mute swan which you had seen uh, earlier in the videos which have been introduced and so you know, certainly a lot of aspects of diversity need to be considered. Um, some ducks are called dabbling ducks and if you look at how they feed um, they stay close to the surface and they then duck their heads underwater to use their large uh, bills uh, to um, to get aquatic vegetation and sometimes even uh, invertebrates and uh, the like. Um, but then there are uh, ducks which are called diving ducks, uh, which then are capable of uh, going... Um... So we have a number of uh, diving ducks here, such as these ring neck ducks. Um, and as you'll see, uh, they continually dive under the water and feed uh, that uh, way. So there's a diversity not only in duck species, uh, but then in how they feed, diving ducks versus dabbling ducks. Uh, ring neck ducks, for example, in our area only pass through uh, during uh, migration. Um, as some members of this family are called mergansers, and the mergansers have thin bills which are serrated. And this then, instead of the wide duck bill, which is good for scooping up, say, aquatic vegetation, um, this is then good for, say, hunting uh, fish aquatic invertebrates underneath uh, uh, the water. Um, very often in uh, the ducks in this uh, group, um, I'm sorry, just ducks in general, you can notice a difference between the coloration patterns of males and females. The males have the white chest and the green head. And then you could also see how different one is uh, from another as we compare species, because very often you get a multiple species, say on a pond at one time. And then the question is, well, then this female, you know, whom, which male is a member of her group? With whom can she mate? Um, and the coloration pattern. So for example, this black head and this uh, white spot, um, this uh, identifies the male hooded mergansers as being different from other types of ducks. And so uh, the difference in color patterns, you know, certainly helps members of the same group you know, stay together because they often flock together, migrate together, but also then during mating uh, season, it helps females identify which males uh, belong uh, to their groups. Uh, certainly one of the easily recognizable uh, groups of birds are the birds of prey or raptors, uh, which have, you know, uh, feet and beaks, which are adapted uh, for uh, preying on other groups of organisms. This includes hawks, uh, eagles, uh, falcons, uh, vultures. Uh, once again, we can include other birds like owls as raptors and both groups of vultures, although these are not all uh, you know, equally uh, related uh, to each other. Some in you know, the same family, others uh, not. Um, uh, one of the exciting uh, things is that you know, when I was uh, growing up, uh, there were no bald eagles uh, uh, east of the Mississippi uh, River. Um, certainly, you know, I had never seen one in the wild, and now they are quite common. And so this is, you know, you know, both a sign that there are things that humans can do, such as the use of pesticides, which can decimate wild populations and actually push them towards extinction. Um, but then also things that humans can do, like ban these pesticides and, you know, protect um, wildlife, which can then bring them back to quite healthy uh, populations. Uh, so. Uh, in the Northeast United States, there are a diversity of raptors which can be seen. Uh, ospreys, which aren't closely related to other groups, they kind of form their own uh, group. They uh, are sometimes referred to as fishing eagles. They can be quite large, uh, but they're adapted for um, 
for eating fish. Um, there are different types of eagles throughout the world, and they're not that closely related. So, for example, there are um, fishing eagles, like the bald eagle, and they aren't that closely related to, say, other eagles, like golden eagles and other eagles throughout the world. An eagle is essentially just a big hawk, and then different groups of hawks throughout the world have you know, evolved members which were larger in size. So, once again, uh, eagles um, are not one single group where they're all closely related. Uh, to uh, each other. And the bald eagles, uh, they are primarily feeding on uh, fish. Here you can see one that has kind of more of a mottled um, head um, because uh, the typical color we associate with bald eagles, the white head, the white tail, um, this uh, comes maybe say after five years of life. Uh, the earlier, the younger eagles, you know, are more um, uh, dark in color, and then as they get older, you might see you know patches of uh, of white um, developing before they be you know develop that stereotypical uh, pattern. So here's a younger eagle, not quite uh, uh, mature. Uh, and so I have videos on bald eagles talking about the nest that they reuse and how large uh, they can uh, get. Um, uh, etc. Um, there are a number of smaller raptors in our area, which we call uh, hawks. Some of these hawks are referred to as beautio hawks. Their uh, uh, tails uh, form more of a fan shape. The red-tailed hawk is the most common in our area, but there's also the red-shouldered hawk, just a little bit smaller than red tails. Uh, Broad-winged hawks, which are smaller still, so notice they are beautio hawks. You can see that fan-shaped uh, tail, um, but uh, there are different um, and there are different hawks and there are different sizes. And so they can even coexist in the same area because you know, one might uh, specialize more on you know, smaller uh, rodents uh, and some might live in more in the forest, some more in open fields, some migrate. So here's a rough-legged hawk, which you can see in our area, but only during winter. So during um, uh, other seasons, uh, they are farther north. And so once again, if you wanted to get an appreciation for the diversity of birds in your area, you should bird watch in different seasons. So a rough-legged hawk you could see in the Northeast United States in winter, um, but then come summer, they would then be uh, farther north. You would also want to go to different habitats because, for example, if you were in the forest, that might be a great place to see like a red-shouldered hawk or a red-tailed hawk, but you'd want to be, you know, closer to say a marsh or a wetland uh, to see this harrier hawk. And so and it just says, you know, there are, uh, you know, plants or reptiles that you associate, say, with aquatic habitats uh, versus, you know, deeper woods habitats. Uh, the same would be true of uh, birds and birds of uh, prey, um, where uh, different habitats would have different uh, species. Here is an occipiter hawk, uh, where instead of having a fan-shaped uh, tail, it has a, a narrower tail. Uh, and so uh, the goshawk, the cooper's hawk, and um, oh, uh, the sharp shinned hawk, uh, they are occipiters that one could find in our area. Um, some uh, of the birds of prey are uh, in a group uh, known as falcons. Uh, they've adapted uh, their uh, body to be extremely fast flyers, and the peregrine falcon is the fastest uh, flying bird um, and known in, uh, in the world. So here you can see a, uh, a falcon, um, a merlin specifically, uh, feeding on uh, something that it had um, it had captured. Once again, falcons can vary in uh, size. Um, the kestrel is quite small, and therefore um, a, a large part of its diet is uh, uh, is insects. And so, for example, you know, grasshoppers and other things you can see it hovering and then going down uh, on its prey are uh, are an important part of its diet. Um, while then others are uh, larger. Uh, such as this uh, peregrine falcon, which is the, once again the fastest flying bird in the world. Here is another example of a bird uh, which had completely disappeared from the eastern United States because of pesticide use, but because of conservation, uh, then it has a return. Uh, and so, you know, once again, you know, uh, humans should you know concern themselves with the negative impacts that they have, um, but also capable of then having 
positive impacts as well. As we go through the diverse species of um, you know, bird there are in the world, um, we should keep in mind that speciation is a gradual process and some species actually can interbreed a little bit. So before two groups are 100% separated as distinct species, um, they can interbreed a tiny bit. So here, for example, is a hybrid between a peregrine falcon and a jur falcon. Um, uh, and so, you know, once again, that's uh, is something we have to be careful uh, about in nature. There's actually some um, distinction between, uh, you know, some interbreeding between species. The New World vultures, like the turkey vulture, uh, the black vulture, and farther west condors, they are a distinct group from uh, the Old World uh, vultures, uh, not closely related to them. And, you know, some classifications of birds actually put, you know, these turkey vultures outside the group, which includes hawks and uh, eagles, while they feed on meat, they almost never kill. Um, and so they'll feed primarily on, um, on dead uh, or you know, sometimes dying uh, animals. Uh, there are different species. Uh, the black vulture, which has a black head as opposed to the, uh, the turkey vulture, um, they're becoming more common in our area because of climate change. So as the area uh, you know, warms and undergoes a different climate, you can see the shifts of you know, bird uh, uh, populations um, uh, in, uh, this, uh, uh, in this area. Now, owls are often you know, and considered you know, within this group uh, of raptors. Uh, laws which protect raptors would include both hawks, eagles, owls, etc. Uh, but owls are unrelated uh, to uh, hawks and eagles. So this is a different uh, group of birds which has adapted uh, to a predatory uh, lifestyle uh, differently. Um, while some can be seen at dusk, and some are active in uh, the day, such as the burrowing owl, um, typically they come out at, at night, and so therefore uh, they've adapted their eyes and also their ears uh, to be excellent hunters at, at night. So for example, the light of a single candle is enough light for them to hunt, say, in the area of, say, several football stadiums. So, you know, that's, you know, their eyes are incredibly sensitive to dark, um, but they're also incredibly good at hearing. If they're up in a tree, they can hear rodents moving underneath um, the snow, making noises um, uh, with sufficient accuracy to be able to go in with their talons and come out with, um, uh, with uh, their prey. Um, and so owls are certainly uh, fascinating. Owls vary in size, you know, so there are large owls, small owls. And so obviously smaller ones would be feeding more on, you know, say mice, while larger ones could feed on, say, skunks. And since they don't have a, a sense of smell, um, then say the great horned owl would be the major predator of, um, uh, of skunks. Um, they, uh, you know, some migrate, some stay in an area all year round. Uh, the short-eared owl, for example, can be seen uh, in this uh, part of the country only during winter uh, because then uh, during uh, summer they will be occurred uh, north of here. The great horned owl, these uh, horns are tufts. They're just actually um, uh, uh, feathers, uh, so obviously not uh, horns. And so there's a diversity of owl species in our area. So here's uh, the barred owl, for example. Um, as I had said, there are as many species of birds uh, as there are mammals, reptiles, and amphibians combined. And certainly there's a large number of groups of birds. So the pigeons and doves, uh, for example, have specific um, Feeders not only are really good flyers, um, but they can produce crop milk for, um, uh, for their young to nourish uh, them. Um, notice that in various groups, then their body plans, their beaks, etc., can be adapted for different types of feeding. Um, and so just as the raptors were adapted to preying on, uh, on other living things, uh, the uh, a, a number of these groups, you know, are adapted, say, for eating plants and seeds, etc. Um, turkeys have such a strong gizzard that they can actually break up, say, walnuts. I mean, walnuts are incredibly hard, but a turkey could eat a walnut and actually crush it in its gizzard and then get nutrients um, out of that. Uh, turkeys were also um, 
uh, uh, birds, uh, which had largely, largely disappeared because of hunting, but conservation has made them quite common uh, again. Uh, however, we still have to watch uh, for uh, decreases in population. For example, uh, currently, ruffed grouse populations are uh, decreasing, and you know, we're concerned that you know, they you know, are declining and may become endangered. Um, some bird species have been introduced from different parts of the world. So pheasants were originally from Asia, not originally native to North America. As we go through the groups of birds, once again, we could study families and different groups. You know, one group of birds is called the kingfishers. Their elongated bills allow them to um, dive into water and come out uh, with uh, fish. The smallest birds in the world, and also the birds with the highest metabolisms, most rapid uh, heartbeats, uh, are the hummingbirds. Now, the ruby-throated hummingbird is the, uh, the main, perhaps almost only, hummingbird east of the Mississippi uh, River. Whereas if you were to go to, say, Latin America and in tropical forests, uh, one would find a great diversity of different species of a humming bird. And so and not only are there different species uh, throughout the world, but certain species are far more diverse in certain parts of the world than in uh, others. Uh, one of the things that hummingbirds are noticeable, uh, uh, noted for, is that uh, they can pollinate specific types of flowers. They very often have a tubular uh, shape and are often red. Bees see the color red as black, uh, whereas um, Butterflies and hummingbirds can perceive red. So when you see red tubular flowers, uh, these are probably pollinated uh, by uh, hummingbirds or butterflies. And you can see a hummingbird at these uh, cardinal flowers uh, here. Um, nighthawks are uh, birds. And you know when we look at nighthawks and then other you know, uh, birds such as swifts and, um, and swallows, which are spending a great deal of time uh, flying and often flying at uh, dusk. These are actually cousins of owls. So as I had said, owls are not uh, closely related to hawks and eagles, even though we consider them as raptors when it comes to term of legislation. So things like uh, swifts, um, uh, nighthawks would be more closely related uh, to owls. I had mentioned woodpeckers uh, before. Uh, so woodpeckers have adapted their heads so they can slam their heads into um, uh, into wood and make holes uh, and thus feed on insects. Um, because of that, woodpeckers don't have to migrate south necessarily. You can find them in winter because there are insects alive in winter. They're just not out and about. They're often you know, hiding within uh, trees. And so woodpeckers can actually feed on insects all throughout the year, as opposed to most birds which feed on insects which have to then fly south for the winter. Uh, woodpeckers have very long tongues. Not only does it stretch the length of their bill, but then it actually will then go around their skull and end near their eye. And thus when they make a hole, they have this very long tongue that can then um, be inserted into the hole and barb insects um, uh, that they can then remove. So for example, carpenter ants are something that you know, uh, um, woodpeckers can feed on. And, you know, they're very adapted uh, to doing uh, that. Uh, they're also adapted so that they can you know, sit vertically uh, on uh, tree trunks. The pileated woodpecker that you saw there is a large woodpecker, the largest in our area, um, but there are certainly others. Uh, not only can they you know, hit wood in order to make holes uh, to, um, to get insects, um, but also this can, instead of making mating calls, this is what's called drumming. So in the spring, males uh, can drum to like say, announce their territories. Um, uh, or to attract females. And here you can see a pileated woodpecker, you know, and after it's made its hole, its long tongue uh, is uh, going in the hole to grab uh, ants. And you can see some ants, you know, uh, here and there. So there's an ant and the, the, the pileated woodpecker is uh, looking for that. Um, one other advantage that uh, woodpeckers have is many birds suffer a lot of predation in nests. So, you know, there are a lot of things that can find bird nest and then, um, uh, you know, prey on the eggs. A lot of snakes are in trees. Um, but since woodpeckers can make holes, they can make fresh holes where they can then have protected nests and these can be new each year. So the predators in the area may not have, you know, found that nest hole yet. And so therefore woodpecker 
nestlings uh, tend to have a much greater rate of surviving than a typical. So here you see a parent uh, red-bellied woodpecker going into uh, this hole to feed um, its young. Uh, both males and females here are uh, feeding the young and you can see that there's a slightly different pattern and how much red is on the head as you compare the males uh, to um, uh, the females. Uh, there are certainly variations, you know, in all groups, not only in size, um, but also say flickers will spend, you know, more time on the ground, you know, and, and feeding on ants, less time in, in trees, um, whereas uh, the yellow-bellied sapsucker um, makes a lot of holes in trees, not looking necessarily for insects, um, but with the idea that it can then um, uh, ingest uh, the, uh, the sap. And so there's diversity in uh, this group. And so uh, in this playlist, uh, which includes the birds which are not passerine birds, the next group, uh, there's a diversity of birds ranging from you know, doves and turkeys. Here's that yellow-bellied uh, uh, sap sucker. And you see all these little holes, not necessarily looking for insects, um, but then also you know, capable of then ingesting uh, the sap and feeding that way. Birds can be divided into orders, and the most abundant bird order is what's called passeriforms, the passerine birds. They tend to be smaller, they are often brightly colored, although not necessarily, and they have modifications of their throat, a structure known as the syrinx, which then allows them to be very, very vocal. So the songs produced in this group, you know, a, a far more melodious than what you would hear, say, in a heron for uh, example, or a hawk. Uh, and so these small, uh, often brightly colored singing birds are sometimes referred to as the song birds. And once again, they are the most common birds. So there are more birds in this order, passeriforms, than in any other bird order. And they also then evolved late. All right, so if you look in the fossil record, you know, there are uh, duck ancestors and raptor ancestors long before there are passerine birds. So although passerine birds are the most common birds uh, alive uh, uh, today and the most diverse species, uh, this was the last group to evolve. Now obviously you can see here um, there's uh, birds which are trying to address the issue of how does one um, how does one find members of one's group or during mating season? How does one you know, distinguish between members of one species to members of another? And here you can see that the passerines often uh, are very colorful. Uh, here you can see you know, these elongated you know, feathers. They make species specific songs, um, all of which then help say females know which males belong to them. So these long tailed feather in the scissored, um, uh, tailed uh, flycatcher, um, they only occur in males. And very often uh, some bright coloration patterns only occur in males. And this helps the females identify uh, the males of their group. Um, the flycatchers that you just saw are very you know, colorful um, and they're from Latin America. So we have flycatchers which exist in the North uh, East United States, like kingbirds, phoebes, peewees, etc. Um, but they don't tend to have the bright colors which we see in, um, in flycatchers uh, throughout, uh, and flycatchers throughout the world. Um, so uh, here, um, uh, there are diverse uh, passerine uh, birds. These would include uh, things like uh, crows, uh, which are uh, larger. Uh, crows are actually related to blue jays. They are in uh, the same uh, family. Um, uh, as we go through this, that's obviously the longest. I just want to, you know, quickly show uh, there are uh, certainly um, a smaller uh, passerine birds like uh, chickadees. Crows would be larger. Some can spend the winter, uh, where others uh, then are more migratory. And so, as we uh, look at them, you can ask them what are they feeding on. If you're feeding more on seeds. Uh, then perhaps you could actually spend uh, a winter in an, an area. Um, but then if you're feeding uh, on insects or uh, on uh, fruits, uh, then perhaps the most um, you know, adaptive thing is to migrate south uh, because in winter there would be uh, too little 
uh, uh, food source to, uh, to support the population. So here you can see the eastern uh, bluebird uh, here. Um, and so uh, we could break the passerine order into different families. So blackbirds, they would form a family. This would not only include the red-winged uh, blackbird, which we see uh, here, um, where the males have that uh, bright uh, coloration, um, but would it also include the cowbird. A couple of interesting things about the cowbird is um, they used to live farther west in more open environments, and it was only after humans, you know, deforested a lot of the great forest of the eastern United States that they were able to come to this area. Now, cowbirds are what are called brood parasites, where they will lay their eggs in the nest of other birds, and the young cowbirds then, um, uh, then often kill uh, the uh, the birds that belong in the nest, and then the parent birds actually then uh, raise and feed this nest parasite its offspring instead of their own uh, offspring. Now, cowbirds uh, are having a devastating impact on native species. So many native species are in decline because of the effects of this nest uh, parasitism, and because cowbirds of uh, prefer more open areas. Uh, they are more able to uh, affect the nests in areas which are deforested. So if we take a big chunk of forest and then put houses here, houses there, you create more open environments, which then make the birds of the forest more vulnerable now to these, um, uh, these brood uh, parasites. Um, and so uh, we can go through, you know, there are certainly this great diversity of uh, bird uh, species, you know, in various families of uh, the passerine birds. And when you look at their bills, uh, some of the bills are narrower and are uh, thus better able, uh, you know, to feed on uh, uh, berries and insects, while other uh, beaks are thicker, uh, like cardinals, sparrows, gross beaks, uh, and then uh, thus are better able to crush uh, seeds. And so there's a great diversity of these passerine uh, birds. Uh, and very often, you know, we like them because of uh, their brilliant uh, colors and their ability to make a uh, song in uh, many species. Um, for bird watchers, one of, you know, the, uh, the groups which, you know, is most interesting is a group of passerine birds known as the warblers. Um, they often are very colorful and have very specific patterns. So this species of warbler has a very distinctive pattern compared to that species of warbler. Uh, they're quite melodious, and so many bird watchers will know that, say, this species, the yellow warbler, its cadence sounds like sweet, 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 I'm so sweet, while then uh, a yellow throat would make a cadence such as witchity, witchity, witchity. And so as you know, bird watchers go throughout the forest, you know, very often they're trying to identify uh, birds by sound in addition uh, to by uh, sight. Some of these uh, warblers may spend all year, or I'm sorry, all summer in uh, the Northeast United States, while others are migrating through. So uh, say during uh, spring, you know, one would see say the yellow rumped warbler or the palm warbler um, migrating through, but they would not be there uh, throughout uh, at, uh, all summer. And so uh, as here's a chestnut-sided warbler in this playlist, then I focus on the individual species of warbler and we'll then, you know, cover are they um, uh, here in the Northeast United States throughout the summer? Are they simply migrating through? Um, some species are in decline, all right, and so uh, golden-winged uh, warblers uh, and blue-winged warblers are in decline and actually capable of hybridizing. Uh, so uh, just like there was a, a hybrid falcon, uh, there can be hybrid warblers between, say, the golden-winged warbler and uh, the blue-winged warbler. Uh, and so one of you know, the, the points that I, I make uh, to my students in conclusion is that you know, there's this incredible diversity of life. And certainly, if you were to ever go on vacation, you know, one could observe, you know, great diversity in the, this faraway place that you've never seen before. Um, but there's often a great diversity of wildlife in one's own area. And a lot of people who live in that area their entire lives will never see many of the species which live there. And so if you want to appreciate biodiversity, certainly you can, you know, get to know, you know, better the biodiversity in your area.
Um, now this would include you know observing in different seasons because there are certain species that you might only be able to find in your area uh, during winter or during the migration uh, season. And this is certainly important because biodiversity is being lost. So birds are being impacted by things like habitat, um, loss, climate change, and many bird species are in decline and being lost from former areas of uh, their range. Uh, and many birds need habitat not in for a summer range, a winter range, and also then throughout their migratory uh, path. And so as there are environmental shifts and changes in each of these, then that's you know, certainly putting great pressure on uh, these uh, birds. Um, for example, with climate change, as the Northeast United States warms, many of these birds uh, are uh, wintering, say, in Latin America, and they're coming back uh, to uh, uh, North America and timing their migration so they are hitting the insect populations um, just at the right time. So as they're migrating through, they're getting uh, uh, insects uh, right at the right time to give them the nourishment to make the next leg of their journey. But then as the climate shifts, then when leaves are coming out, that's changing. Thus, when insects are coming out of you know, their eggs and hatching, that's changing. And so sometimes when birds are now migrating north, the food you know, uh, supplies which they were expecting are, you know, no longer there in the same way. So this affects do they have enough energy, you know, to make it all of the way, uh, how many eggs can they lay uh, and the like. And so, uh, you know, our human actions, and certainly in the past and then today with climate change, deforestation and other effects, certainly have had great impacts on uh, wild populations. Now, some of these are negative, uh, but then we are also capable of then making uh, changes which then benefit these um, uh, these populations. And so, you know, I would certainly encourage all of my students to, you know, try to appreciate the great biodiversity uh, around them, including the biodiversity of birds, and then also to consider ways uh, in which uh, we can lessen our human impact on the world and then help preserve this great biodiversity.